Christ of I am Shannon Hanley, and we are so glad to be worshiping with Pastor Shannon Jamal Hollemans this morning. I, of course, have lots of announcements to share. The first being, I want to draw your attention to the fact that we are having Laugh Fest here. We are a location for Laugh Fest on March 8th. It's a Friday. Tammy Pescatelli will be here for a family-friendly show. Uh, tickets are available online at the Flat River Gallery on Main Street, and they will be sold at the door the day of the event. We're having beverages, a great comedian. It'll be a great time if you're interested in coming. Um, Foodmobile at Prom is happening on March 30th. That's the week that we are responsible for. We need volunteers from 8.15 to 11.45 a.m. If you're interested in volunteering, they should see Teresa Beecham. Uh, we are continuing our Lenten Bible study, The Invitational God. It's meeting Thursdays, yes? Thursdays from 6.30 to 8. So come, enjoy dinner at open table, and then stay for the Bible study. That is available to you. Of course, if you're interested in being on a ministry team, you can let us know, and we will be happy to get that set up for you. Roland can take your name. Teresa can take your name. Shannon or I can help get you set up. Take a look at the Social Justice Lending Library. They have pulled out special things for Black History Month. So it's always a good resource for lots of different topics, but this month they have lots of things pulled aside for uh, Black History Month, so take a look. February 24th, the Grand Rapids Pitbull Alliance will be here again with their mobile food distribution that's happening every fourth Saturday. If you are in need of food for your pets, you can stop by. They have all their own volunteers. We don't have to do that, yay. Um, youth group is meeting February 24th as well at 4.30 here at church. The cost is $10 per person or $20 per family. We're going to a restaurant in Grand Rapids called Little Africa for some amazing vegetarian African food. So it's awesome, excited about that. February 21st, 20, uh, February 25th is our open and affirming anniversary celebration. So please stay by, stay around for that. Open Table, of course, is looking for your volunteer hours. We still have those games to sell. If anyone does not have a copy of one of those games yet, please see Shannon and she will get you set up. Any birthdays from this week that we need to mention? Okay, it's a busy February month. Uh, I'm gonna draw your attention to these little cards in the pews. If you have any change in information, if you would like any information, if you have any thoughts or comments, you can go ahead and put these on here and then put those in the offering plate. Each week during uh, Black History Month, we have someone from the social justice team coming to share some of their favorite resources. So at this time, I'd like to invite Roland. and I was going to go out there and get it to show it, but I didn't succeed at that. What? The sum of us. Thanks. Um, so yeah, my name is Roland Hawksbergen, and uh, <clears throat> I have always been concerned about racism, always uh, aware of it, uh, but as uh, since I was a little kid, actually, I don't know why, uh, just is. Uh, but I have realized how much throughout my life I have learned about racism and how I keep learning and growing in my own understanding of my own complicity in racism and, and, and how much I'm privileged as a result of the way I look and the circumstances I've been growing in. I didn't used to think that, but I am increasingly aware of it. And every time I turn around, it seems like there's a new event that teaches me, me another thing uh, that, that, boy, life has been really paved in gold for me in many ways. And, and uh, you know, I like that, <laughs> not complaining. But anyway, I want to uh, uh, share with you a couple of things that uh, have been, uh, of, of many, that have been really good for me and very helpful. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll start with the book. Uh, that two years ago, a number of us, uh, several of us here, uh, sat down and studied and read through. That book is called The Sum of Us. 
but we don't have it. Oh, okay. It's right somewhere. Oh, okay. So you can see it there when, when you go out and maybe if you want to take it, you may. But this is a book about by a, a woman named Heather McGee who was studying democracy and and uh, in a situation where she could learn about these things. And she kept asking, she's black herself, uh, and asking why it was that we were so racist. And she, she figured out, or she, she was curious why it is that we did things that were so damaging for all of us. And you know, she was just very curious about that. So she wrote a book called The Sum of Us. And uh, it was uh, what she discovered is that in this particular country, those of us who are privileged seem to do things in ways that are harmful to us just so those people don't get some privileged things or some good things. And so she goes through this book explaining how much we harm ourselves with the activities that we engage in, the laws that we have, and I don't know, all, all kinds of stuff like that. And, uh, and, and, and she explores how it is that our lives are so much damaged by our racism, and not just people of color, but us too, or us white people. I mean, that's what I'm putting myself in. And she goes through uh, chapter by chapter, our healthcare situation, our housing situation, labor situation, schooling, environment, uh, and, and then finally gets to a chapter and says, oh, how could we do better? And then she, she explains how we could do better. So that's a real nice addition. And, and the whole book is, it's, it's not like in your face, it's just, uh, let's explore what happened here. You know, redlining, for example, in housing and how, how black people were prohibited from getting loans to finance their houses. So yeah, life has been hard for them. The other thing I want to mention is a movie. And this is a movie that I chose not to watch for a long time because there's something I didn't know about it. I, I did hear a lot of people saying this is one of their favorite movies uh, on this this general topic. But um, I didn't watch it because it just sounded to me like, oh, this is going to be another one of those preachy things and it's going to make me feel bad about life and so forth. And I finally watched it. The title was off putting to me. I didn't know where it came from. I'll tell you now. Maybe you know, uh, maybe you don't. But the title is The Hate You Give. And the U is a U instead of a, of, um, of a Y O U. Uh, well, so I finally watched it because I was, must have been really bored or something and, and all by myself, my wife's in Florida, you know, that sort of thing. Well, better watch it. And I realized, man, this is a really good movie. People who watched this were right. This is, this is amazing. Um, and what I, what I discovered, oh, just first about the title. The title comes from a rapper named uh, Tupac Shakur. And uh, The Hate You Give, is that it actually comes from something he had tattooed on his abdomen called Thug Life. And Thug Life, as 30 years ago, he said, well, what that means is the hate you give, um, the hate you give little infants, and I'll use a different word, harms, uh, harms everyone. <laughs> you can imagine what word he used for, that might start with F. Um, so uh, that's the where they got the name of the movie. This is a real honest movie. It's nuanced. It's great, you know, acting and a great story. And uh, and I thought it was just really good. It's about uh, some tough subjects, like growing up in a racialized society. Um, the star of the show, whose name is indeed Star with two R's. Uh, she's a 17 year old or so uh, young woman or young girl girl in a high school uh, and she goes to an all white high school because her parents wanted to put her into a good school. And so what you end up with is uh, walking through this complex world in which she is navigating her own identity, uh, trying to figure out what kind of a voice she's going to have dealing with the very troublesome issues of gangs in her neighborhood of of a, of a killing of a, of a friend that she has and then and she has been a witness to it and and how is she going to respond to that what's she going to end up go with the black community is she going to go with the white community uh and all of these are uh, it's a it's a really fascinating story uh and uh and she has to learn how to stand up for what is right and she tries um, 
I learned a lot from the book. I learned a lot from the movie, uh, both and, and there's lots of other books and lots of other movies too. So uh, my encouragement to you is to keep reading, keep uh, listening, keep watching, keep thinking, keep loving, keep serving, and at times even fighting and, and struggling. And uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know if you watched John Stewart this week, he's back on the air and he said, you know what? And you gotta keep doing this every day of your life for all eternity, <laughs> as long as you, as long as the sun shines and you're alive. It's it never, you never give up. And, and it, it was encouraging to me, you know, you know uh, or it was encouraging, it was just interesting to me that, I think Jesus said something like that. <laughs> you just got to keep at it, keep going, uh, and, and so on. Anyway, those are two things. The, the, the sum of us is the book. The hate you give is the movie. Uh, the, the hate you give streams on a lot of different services, so take advantage of it. Thank you so much, Roland. I, I find new good memories every week created at this church, and I think Roland explaining thug life is going to be one of those <laughs> memories I ponder in my heart. <laughs> that was really helpful, though. Um, I invite you all to rise, either in body or in spirit, uh, to receive God's greeting to us this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God who created you, from God who has saved you, and from God who is at work even now, empowering and equipping you to be about the work of spreading God's light in the world. As God greets us with these words, I invite you to pass the peace to one another. Please remain standing as we say together uh, the call of worship printed in our bulletins. God is healing. When a woman who had suffered for years sought Jesus and touched just the hem of his robe, her very life was healed. We seek the God of healing. God is growth. After floodwaters destroyed the world as Noah knew it, God hung their bow in the sky, pointed it toward the heavens as a symbol of God's promise never to invoke wrath so creation can flourish. We wait for the God of growth. God is transformation. When Tamar was abandoned by the family she married into, with tenacity she took matters into her own hands. We welcome the God of transformation. God is change. When God invited Abraham to leave everything behind, Abraham, with curiosity, wonder, and a spirit of adventure, moved. We come to worship the God of change. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to song number seven, All People That on Earth Do Dwell.
Now is a time in our service where we uh, share with one another our praises, the ways that we have recognized God working in our lives, and our prayer requests, the ways that we can be praying for one another in this season. Does anyone have a prayer request or a praise to share this morning? I'll start with one. Um, many of you know my dad has stage four cancer. Um, it's been a years long struggle. Um, and this week he was in the hospital uh, Thursday and Friday, just really not feeling well. His chemo is really taking a toll on him. Um, but thankfully he was able to go home on Saturday. Um, and uh, with some drugs help, he was able to sleep last night for the first time in a week. So um, just pray for God's continued um, hand in his life right now through this season. So, God, in your mercy. My prayer is a thanksgiving. Um, the Lum family finally got to celebrate Christmas yesterday and Chinese New Year, and it was a glorious time and I'm very thankful today. My heart is full. God, for joyful gatherings, we praise you. Now bring our prayers to God and we will conclude saying the Lord's Prayer together. God of love, sacred mystery at the heart of all things, you are holy. God, as we come and rest at your feet right now, there is so much going on in our world. There is so much going on in our hearts and our minds. So God, we pray today for your peace to spread out, beginning within each of us and extending to the communities in which we live and to our world. God, we pray that those who have particular needs today, needs for healing, needs for comfort, needs for strength, will have those needs met. God, as we struggle with our own issues, with our own senses of shame and guilt, we ask that you empower each of us with the ability to forgive ourselves for the ways that we have failed and to strive to do better. God, may we forgive others for the ways they failed us and invite them to do better, even as they forgive themselves and us. And God, as we face difficulties and challenges, may we do so with courage, with humor, with humility, and with grace. If we must face evil, may we not be overcome by it, but may we overcome evil with love. For love is the measure of all things and the hope of humanity. So together, God, we pray the words that you taught us to pray. Our God, who is in heaven, blessed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Now we are invited to give back to God a small portion of what God has given us, uh, whether that's in the resources of um, money or time or talents. Um, as you sit and listen to the offertory, I invite you to reflect on the goodness of God and what it looks like in your life. And as um, the offering collectors come forward, um, 
Just remember that God is good and God's mercy endures forever. Let us pray together. Loving creator, you have given us every good thing in our lives. We return to you now a portion of these gifts to share. Empower us to steward them well for the flourishing of your world. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to ask any young people to come forward that would like to share this morning. I'm gonna to sit today. You guys wanna sit with me? Hmm. All right, well, I brought some candy with me today. So I thought that I would share. Now, I wanna tell you that um, I hurt my wrist, my left wrist. So I'm favoring this side of my body today, which means I'm favoring and protecting it, right? So I'm going to favor my left-hand side, and I'm going to give candy to the people on, the, on my left, okay? So people on my left, feel free to take a candy out of that bowl. Lydia, come on up, grab one. Take whatever you like on my left. All right. Hmm. So is this fair? No, it's not fair. But... I have the power, I'm in charge, I can do it. People should sit on my left if they want candy. <laughs> People over here. Sophia, come on up, you want a candy? I have candies for people on my left, all right? Now imagine if I kept doing this every day, every time we had children's time, if I only gave treats to people on my left, what would start to happen? What would start to happen? Nobody would, be on your right. Nobody would be on my right. Everyone would change sides, right? Would some people be upset? The accidental people on my right would be annoyed that they didn't get candy, right? 
How might you start to feel about me? Would you think I'm a fair person? No, because I'm not fair, am I? Only people on my left. You might start to treat me and other people like I treat people, right? You might start to say, Thea might start to go, well, I only want to give treats to people on my left, okay? Liam and Felix might say, we don't even want to deal with those people on the left. You're going to choose the right side. Well, and the left, Oren, you are so good. Without knowing it, we might start bad feelings about choosing sides, one side or the other, right? Okay? We might, 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 we might start to make people feel bad. We might start to change things based on who has the power, right? In the Bible story today, Jesus talks about who has the power and who can steward that power, who can be in charge of it, how we use it for good. Now, Oren's already said he would use his power for good. He would use his power for good because he would make sure that it was fair. And that's what God calls us to do all the time. So people on my right can also have a treat. Okay? We do want it to be fair. And Jesus calls us every day to act to make things fair and just for all people. Will you guys join me in prayer? Dear God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for showing us that we are all equal. We are all important. Everyone is valued. And we need to use our power to make sure that there's justice and fairness in the world. In your name we pray. Amen. As the children leave for their classes, I invite you to rise as you are able in body or in spirit and turn to number 23 in your hymnals. There's a wideness in God's mercy. seated. Our scripture passage today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 10. It's not a passage that pe preachers uh, preach on very often, um, but I thought, hey, why not? I think uh, it'll be an interesting message today. So uh, we'll read verses 1 through 12. Uh, and afterward, you'll see I did not print in the bulletin the usual thing that we have uh, after I read the word, which is, you know, here ends the lesson, may God transform understanding into action, simply because I did not have room in the bulletin to print it. So I will say it, and you are invited to say amen after that if you would like. Jesus left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds again gathered around him. As was his custom, he taught them. Some, testing him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? 
They said, well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house with the disciples, they asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. So in most Bibles, the passage that we just read is labeled under a subheading that reads something like Jesus teaching about divorce. And at first glance, we might agree. But I think a careful reading of this text within its larger context in scripture, which remember was not divided into verses or chapters and definitely not subheadings, <laughs> will reveal to us that what actually is happening in this lesson that Jesus gives has very little to do with marriage and divorce. It has more to do with what Shannon talked about this morning, how we steward our power. So Jesus is traveling with his disciples. And as they go, Jesus is about the work of exercising the demons that had been holding people in their grips. And through his teaching, freeing people from the toxic ideas that had bound their lives in many ways. This was not casual or simple work. Jesus is meeting those with desperate needs. That's who's coming out to see him as he travels. And he is giving them the, holy, the hope and the healing that they so desperately need. But as Jesus is about this work, changing the lives of everyone he touches, he is garnering a lot of attention and not always positive attention. And as Jesus following grows, religious leaders are hearing about what he's saying and what he's doing, and they rightfully feel threatened by him. Because while Jesus did not come with a new message about God and who God was, the story that Jesus was sharing about God was building upon the stories people already knew, but the way Jesus was sharing that story and the way Jesus lived out that story and the way Jesus called people to live out God's story were very much a threat to those who had been misinterpreting God's story and twisting it to serve their own purposes, purposes that place them in positions of power purposes that entailed creating molds for godly living that resembled their own images more than the very image of God. Purposes that were reflected in boundaries that were drawn around the goodness of God, saying that those within it were within God's favor and those outside of it were not. What Jesus is saying here in this story is not very much actually about marriage and divorce. It is about how those with more power treat those who have less power. In the chapter before our reading this morning, we could look back and see the work that Jesus was about, the ways that people were being healed, the ways that people's lives were changed by the message that Jesus was sharing. But you can also read about Jesus growing frustration with the people around him. In verse 19 of chapter 9, it's pretty clear. If you look back at that verse, Jesus calls his disciples, those closest to him, unbelieving or faithless. Jesus was angry that they could not trust what he was doing, that his actions and his words were not translating into trust in him. Jesus was working hard. And so it's understandable that he would grow frustrated when in spite of all of his best efforts, even those closest to him just were not getting it. 
In the passage we just read, the religious leaders come to Jesus and they try to catch him saying the wrong thing again, this time by asking him a question about a heated subject, marriage and divorce. The Jewish rabbis that were prominent in that day were actually debating it quite a bit at that time. So they asked Jesus, is it morally acceptable or permissible for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus turns their question back to them. Well, what did Moses say when he gave you the law that you live by? They're like, well, he said it was cool. But Jesus wouldn't let them leave it at that. Jesus said, you're right. Moses said, this is morally acceptable because you all frankly have issues. But that is not what God intended for you when God created you. And then Jesus goes on to explain. Jesus explains how God created people in all of their diversity to grow up in a family, in a community, and then to create their own families, their own communities, defined by equitable relationships. Families that God themselves sustains. Families bound together by faithfulness to God and each other. And we read that the disciples had more questions about this. So as was their practice, they waited until they were alone with Jesus to ask him. And Jesus elaborated. And in expanding on his thoughts, Jesus takes the opportunity to paint them an image of equity and faithfulness with just a few words by sharing an unfamiliar image with them, an image of a woman actually having the ability to divorce her husband. Because this was not the world that they lived in. In their world at that time, it was not uncommon for a man to divorce his wife in order to hook up with somebody else. Not uncommon at all. It actually still happens in the Middle East. Women were treated as nothing more than tokens to be used for men's gratification. So it's easy for us to look at this passage from our own culture and our own standing and go, oh, Jesus is talking about what we know to be marriage and divorce. It's so very different. I'll give you a little insight from my own family. I uh, had an aunt who, um, when she was 15 years old, was assaulted by a man sexually. And um, her, the culture at that time said that uh, because she was no longer a virgin, she had to marry that man. And so she did. She had to marry the man who assaulted her. Um, she was married to him for maybe a year before he decided he wanted someone else. And he then was required to marry that other person and she was off the hook um, because he assaulted somebody else. And so she was used as nothing more than a token um, because she was a female and that's the way it was. And often when I look back at the stories of my aunts and my grandmother, many of them who were married multiple times, um, it was because they were nothing more than tokens, right? Um, Women are only as valuable as your fertility in many cultures, um, especially in the Middle East. And it's really hard to see and to watch. And this is the culture that Jesus was talking in. It was not a culture where the women actually had the ability to hand their husband a certificate of divorce. It was not equitable relationships. It was about abuse and people being treated as less than human. So Jesus, in explaining this to his disciples and his disciples um, trying to wrap their minds around what is happening here, is trying to show them another vision, a vision of equity, where women and men were on equal footing, where their relationships were mutually give and take. And so Jesus, in answering this question about marriage and divorce, was actually talking about more than marriage and divorce. Jesus was talking about equity in relationships. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, every test presented to Jesus was from somebody with less than honorable intentions, somebody trying to trap him or catch him saying the wrong thing so they could say, hey, gotcha. When we see Jesus' disciples asking questions, their intentions were frequently honorable. They honestly did not know what was happening most of the time. But they were still asking questions, often the same questions, 
that those trying to trap Jesus were asking. Whether the religious leaders or the disciples, people wanted Jesus to give answers. And often people wanted a prescription. They wanted something easy for them to implement. But again and again, Jesus explains that while the law of love is simple, love God and love one another, the implementation of that law of love is far from simple. How we read the Bible matters because the Bible has power over people's lives. So we need to read it and steward it with care. The religious leaders who confronted Jesus were using their sacred texts as weapons to support their own agenda, to justify their own actions and to harm other people, to keep them in positions of privilege and power. The disciples who follow Jesus wanted to know God. They thought they knew this sacred text, but every time Jesus spoke, everything got flipped all around and they were just left with more questions than answers. The stories of God that we find in our sacred texts tell us about the power and the love of God so that we can learn it, so that we can live it. But sometimes we even turn it into an idol, something that we think maybe we can manipulate to serve our own purposes. I know people have used this text, this very text here as an idol to throw as a dagger at people for divorce. But Jesus' story, these stories that he tells were never meant to be pulled out of their context, out of the larger story of what God is doing. And what Jesus came to do was not to write prescriptions and hand them out to people and say, this is how you live, it's just this easy. Jesus consistently invited people to imagine more. When people wanted easy answers, Jesus said, well, let me tell you a story. And then their minds would be blown and they'd be left walking away, shaking their head and going, what was that about? But they were also invited to consider that what God was doing and what God is doing is so much bigger than any of us even imagine most days. The religious leaders were caught up in what is lawful what they could do and what they couldn't do because they wanted to be able to tell other people what was lawful, what they could do and what they couldn't do. But that's not the calling that Jesus was giving to anybody to be about the law. The only law that we have is the law of love. The law that says love God and love your neighbor and everything else needs to just fit in around that. Because if it's not helping you love God and it's not helping you love your neighbor, it is not the law of love that we get from God and that we see in the life of Jesus. Friends, we all have power. We have power to embrace people and power to reject people. Power to encourage people and power to neglect people. Power to hold those with more power accountable and power to walk away when needed. How are we stewarding the power that we have? The power that is in our time, the power that's in our words, the power that's in our pocketbooks, the power that's in our votes. Where are we investing our power, our hearts, our efforts? What relationships are we pouring into? What what relationships do we want to steward really well? Because, friends, the power of God is at work. The way that we show God that we love them is by loving one another. And God's invitation to us, an invitation we're considering, especially in this season of Lent, is to live life abundant. An abundant life is only possible when we are stewarding our power responsibly. As I shared in the prayer request, my dad had a rough week. Um, Because of his chemo, his body is really worn down, and he was in the hospital a couple days. And so yesterday, Kevin and I went and spent the day at his house with him. Um, My dad loves to offer to write my sermons for me. (laughs) He thinks, you know, 
I'm a Muslim, but I've seen the world, I know. I can tell you how, what you need to say to these people. And so yesterday, Kevin said to him, okay, Mohammed, what are you gonna say tomorrow? What should Shannon be preaching on? Um, and he pondered it for a moment. And he said, well, you need to point out to people how we only turn to God when things get hard, but we need to be turning to God all the time. It's something my dad knows a bit about. He continued, when things are going well in my life, it's easy for me to forget God. But when things get hard, it's quick to go and call God and say, hey, where are you? What are you doing? I told my dad, well, this isn't really what this passage is about. But the more I thought about it last night, the more I started to think, huh, maybe it is a bit about what this passage is about. Because we do that with God's word, the Bible. When things get hard, we turn to it, we'll flip to a page and say, okay, God, speak to me, tell me something. Or we'll start searching the Bible for answers or praying that God gives us answers when we need them. But most days when life is moving along, our hearts might neglect to consider who God is and what God's doing, what power God has given us and how we are stewarding it well. Our relationship with God, like our relationships with each other, need to be handled with care. So does our sacred text. So the challenge to us in this season is this. Regardless of our intentions, whether they're rooted in selfish ambition and vain conceit, or in really seeking God and serving God, how are we recognizing the power that we have the power in our time, in our resources, in our hearts, and stewarding those gifts well. In living life abundant to the fullest, life filled with joy, and sharing that joy with others. We are working on this piece of art during the um, season of Lent, you'll see it below. So there were just a handful of us here on Ash Wednesday, and together we created this using the um, ashes from the palms from last year. And in the weeks ahead, um, leading up to Easter, we're going to see this piece of art transform. Some Sundays, Shannon and the kids might add to it. Uh, some weeks, I might ask the senior neighbors to add to it who are in our building. And as we see this piece transform, I don't know what it's gonna look like, honestly. I, I don't have a template in my head. We're just gonna build from here. It's gonna be messy and it's gonna be unpredictable. But I have trust that God is gonna reveal something beautiful through this messiness and that it's gonna reflect who we are and who we are as a community is beautiful. People who explain the thug life to us, people who serve as moderator, people who play the piano. We all have our roles. We all show the abundant love of God to those around us through sharing our gifts and so I'm trusting that this piece of art will reflect the abundant life and love of God that we have as it develops. Now is the time in our service where we are invited to go and celebrate communion together. So as I move down to the table, I invite you to prepare your hearts and your minds to gather as a community. I invite you to follow the communion liturgy printed in your bulletin as we go. People of God, may God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God, our creator. It is right at all times and in all places to thank and praise you, creator of all. We praise you here near where the Grand River meets the Flat River, on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. We praise you, God, at a time when the body of the earth is being broken again and again. We give thanks for our place in the story of God's saving work in the world. Our ancestors journeyed with you in creation and migration 
They depended on the land, were displaced from their lands, and displaced others from their lands. They knew you in tents and cities, on mountains and by wells, in families and in dreams, and through wilderness prophets who spoke of cedars and listened to ravens. Together with the ancestors and the angels, we join our voices with all creation in these ancient words, holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. We give thanks to you for Jesus, whose first bed was a feed trough. He was baptized in the Jordan and tested in the wilderness. He traveled in fishing boats and told parables of farmers and seeds, labor and wages, yeast and bread. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, food for the poor, the work of the field, and the hearth. And he gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine, fruit of the land, and gave it to his friends, saying, This is my blood, which is given for you. When you drink of this, remember me. Remembering Jesus' life, Jesus' death and resurrection, and awaiting Christ's coming kingdom, we offer you this bread and this cup. Let us pray. Creator, send your spirit on these gifts so that we know Jesus in them and are gathered together with everyone who shares the sacred meal of justice and community. Fill us with the courage and love of Jesus, that we may strive for justice and peace, respect the dignity of every human being, and safeguard the integrity of creation. All honor and glory are yours, Creator, Christ, and Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Just a word about the elements that we will share today. Uh, during the season of Lent, it became our practice last year to begin um, recognizing our place as part of the global church around the world. So each week during Lent, we are going to celebrate communion, and the elements of communion will come from different cultures around the world. So today, the elements we have are pita bread and uh, a drink called vimto. So growing up half Lebanese, uh, vimto was always a treat. It's sort of like a soda. Uh, we did this last year as well. Um, it was something that was actually invented in the UK by immigrants and uh, used during prohibition instead of wine. And then now it's used quite frequently for Ramadan um, for Muslims as a sort of a treat to have when they break their fast in the evening. So friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to come forward and take the elements as you are comfortable. There are gluten-free crackers for those who need them. Thank you. 
Friends, I invite you to um, rise in body or in spirit, and together we will say the words of our mission statement printed on our wall. Responding to the living God with a progressive voice and working hands, we are called to feed Christ's community in mind, body, and spirit. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to song number 82, Go My Children with My Blessing. May your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk for justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul stand in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again. Until God's promised day, in the name of the beloved, life is well. Go with me. And go with me. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 